What is good, everybody? Welcome to the Crossover Podcast on the Gold Standard Podcast Network. If you are new to the show, this is where we take a deep dive on the Niners opponent of the week with someone who covers that team and knows them far better than I do. This week, I'm very excited to welcome Kyle Barber, the managing editor of Baltimore Beatdown. That's SB Nation's Ravens community. Kyle, haven't caught up with you in a minute. Thanks for a few minutes. I'm thrilled to be back with you, Stats. I'm always happy to see you. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> This is like the Christmas present that you didn't know you were getting, right? I, I shouldn't say didn't know you were getting, but it's like the one that's in the back that you have to wait to open. So yep, much- that's you, Stats. The Christmas <laughs> present no, I didn't know I was getting. <laughs> not me, the game. The game. <laughs> not me. I'm super excited about this one. I'm nervous, but I'm excited because this is just the second time in the history of the NFL that you have two teams with sole possession of first place in each conference meeting each other this late in the season. This just doesn't happen in the NFL. So here we go. Let's start with when the 49ers have the ball. How does the Ravens defense like to attack opponents? They are definitely a defense that operates with a lot of simulated pressure. They have guys that are capable of rushing the passer at multiple levels. Uh, whether that's the interior rushers with Justin Matabike, who's on an 11 game streak of at least a half sack tying the NFL record versus Jadevian Clowney, Kyle Van Noy and Adafi Owe on the outsides. And all those guys have been excellent contributors as outside linebackers. Even their inside backers like to get involved. Patrick Queen, I believe, is top five on the team in sacks just because he's an excellent delayed blitzer. I mean, probably arguably one of the better ones in the NFL right now. Uh, and it doesn't stop with those guys either. I mean, they like to send guys off of the edge. Arthur Millette has made two enormous plays, I believe in back-to-back games, uh, just being able to come off of the edge uh, out of that nickel area, out of the outside you know, corner area sometimes. Uh, Kyle Hamilton is yet another guy. He is going to be the biggest you know, factor, I, I would argue, in this game uh, defensively for the Ravens. Just the way that the Ravens like to attack with pressure style, that is, that's what's going to be it. In terms of more coverage-based, it's going to be about Kyle Hamilton and how he matches up with Kittle, with Debo Samuel at times, if they if they continue you know running him in the slot, there's a lot of different areas for them, and they need Kyle Hamilton to have arguably his best game. Can they get pressure with just the front four, or do they have to blitz to get pressure? Because if they have to blitz to get pressure, to me, that plays into the 49ers' hands because Brock Purdy has been excellent against the blitz this year. Right. I think that they don't necessarily need to get uh, get there with uh, with more than four. I think they have the talent to do so, but it's going to be hard. I mean, let's just be honest. The 49ers offensive line is really good. The playmakers get open quickly, I would say. Uh, you have one of, if not the best left, left tackle in football. I mean, that's going to be a battle for the Ravens front four. But Justin Matabike, I think, is is a huge crux of that. Like I said, 11 straight games with at least a half sack. That's the NFL record. He's tied with two guys on that, Chris Jones and uh, Trey Hendrickson. So he has an opportunity to break that record. Uh, and, and it's not be on accident that he's doing that. He's <laughs> always had kind of this ability to generate pass rush. It was just inconsistent. Now he's put it all together, and he has playmakers on each side. Like, Genevieve Clowney and Kyle Van Noy are talented outside linebackers, and the Ravens landed both of these guys late in the free agency cycle. One of them, uh, Kyle Van Noy, even midway, uh, not midway, but a few weeks into the season. So they're they're firing well. They work as a unit. It's a lot of unselfish play. That has been the big buzzword of the season for this defense is, is that guys are giving up sacks to help other guys get sacks. Genevieve and Clowney was commanding double teams and helped Kyle Hamilton get three sacks in a single game. So this is a unit that uh, that that works for each other, works in you know in, in synchron- synchronizing with one another, and they are capable of four man rushes. But there's going to be times that they like to send pressure. Mike McDonald likes to send pressure, and that's going to be dangerous, like you said, against this uh, this Brock Purdy 49ers. The interior of the 49ers offensive line is vulnerable for sure. That is where they can be had. So if you're telling me that Baltimore can effectively get pressure there, there's nothing more disruptive to an offense 
than interior pressure, especially quickly. So that's definitely going to be something to keep an eye on. I expect Kyle Shanahan to bootleg Brock Purdy a lot, try and move him out of the pocket, try and just get him out of there so that he doesn't have to just stand in there all the time. And to his credit, Brock has shown the ability that when things do break down, He's got some wiggle to him. Now, he's not Lamar Jackson because nobody's Lamar Jackson, but Brock can escape and make things happen. That's something that uh, gives me the warm and fuzzies when I think about the 49ers quarterback situation. When it comes to the secondary, are they mostly a man team or a zone team? I believe they're mostly man. Um, it it's fluctuates a lot because of the injuries that have kind of bounced around with the Ravens. Marlon Humphrey, their number one corner, former All-Pro uh, he's missed six games this season. He missed the first couple in uh, earlier on. He's dealing with nagging injuries that kind of were bugging them. Uh, so that's kind of caused some risk. So, but they do like to match up in man style for the most part. Uh, you know, Brandon Stevens, the number two corner, has really developed into a starting caliber cornerback opposite of Humphrey. And uh, and he talks, you know, excessively about how he likes being able to be called on to being a cornerback that that can lock up somebody else and and work at it and and the physicality that goes along with it. So this is a defense that likes to do so, but uh, they they really are good in in so many areas and so many ways that you know it sounds like I'm just you know pouring purple Kool Aid all over your podcast, <laughs> but I mean th- this is a number one team in the AFC for a reason. It's because they're good at multiple things, the same way that the 49ers are good at multiple things, and and defensively that's what they enjoy is being capable and being versatile and uh, being unselfish. All right, well, let's put the Kool-Aid down for a minute before we get to the other side of the ball. If there is an area where this Ravens defense has trouble or is a little vulnerable, where do you think it is? I would say it is probably... uh, 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 Run defense has been suspect. as Oh, boy. Yes. Um, They started to solve it last week. Because the last few weeks, they've been struggling. And through the first quarter, they didn't look so hot either. But after about the uh, the second quarter of last week's game against the Jaguars, they started to put it together. Because Travis Etienne had like four and a half to, f- I believe it was up to 5.6 yards per carry through about the first quarter and a half. And they were consistently just being able to run the ball, the Jaguars were. And it's been a common theme uh, and we asked Mike McDonald about that, uh, you know, right before the bye week. And he said it's not a concern or a worry of his, but it's been a consistent enough theme that, you know, uh, they're allowing not chunk plays, not 20 yard gains, but five and six yards, which are crippling for a defense when you're trying to get defenses and, you know, trying to get into third and shorts instead of third and mediums and longs. And, and uh, that is an area of vulnerability and not one you want against Christian McCaffrey and the 49ers. You're not playing Travis Etienne this week. Just throwing that out there. All right, let's flip to the other side of the football. Now, Lamar Jackson, obviously having a fantastic season. Clearly, I think people forgot just how good he is because he's been so banged up recently. What do you see from Lamar this year that has you the most excited? The reads, the progressions, and the ability to just extend plays. Like You just don't want to get desensitized to what he can do with the ball in his hands and, and the way he is elusive. In, in eludes pressure. I mean, that is something that is still the most magical trait about him on the football field is you we've seen players get demoralized from what they've done uh, with, with, with what Jackson has done uh, in, in escaping pressure. I mean, Jadevian Clowney back when he was a Cleveland Brown slammed his helmet uh, in frustration and uh, Miles Garrett just dapped up. Uh, <laughs> Lamar after a play because he's like, there's nothing I can do about this. And that was the same thing that we saw against the Jaguars. And that's, and that's what is so special about him. I mean, even when, when the, when the, the pressure is finally on him, you still have to get him down. There's, there's getting pressure. And then there's tackling Lamar Jackson instead of him throwing a touchdown pass on third and 11 uh, to a receiver. It's just, uh, it, that, that's probably the thing that's still, the most fun thing to watch about him and what impresses you most. That is what I have said all week is that like, you have to just accept that he's going to get you sometimes like you're going to have him wrapped up. He's going to get away. He's going to run for a first down or break a sack and get a completion. Like you cannot get demoralized. You have to just 
move on to the next play. Easier said than done, of course. But I look at this Ravens offense and I say, there's no Mark Andrews. Now, unfortunately, you just lost Keaton Mitchell, who was a massive, massive part of the offense. I think his speed combined with Lamar's speed was a huge threat to defenses. Obviously, that is not there now. So where does Lamar look when he says, hey, I need a play? Who's he going to? It has mostly been Zay Flowers, uh, the rookie wide receiver. Zay has the, I believe, the second most targets. He might have the first most targets now with Mark Andrews out. He has most receptions, and he has been a consistent threat for the Ravens. Uh, but that's not the only guy. Lamar still likes bigger receivers. He still likes his Isaiah Likely, who has really stepped up in absence of Mark Andrews. That's the backup tight end. And Likely has come on strong. I believe he's got, you know, nearing 200 yards. He's got a, a pair of touchdowns over the last two and a half games since Andrews went down. And, and along those lines, he still searches for... I would say Odell Beckham Jr., and that's almost to a fault. We've seen the way that in the red zone at times, Lamar is looking his way, and and regardless of whether Beckham or not has generated separation, he still throws the ball his way, and it's been dangerous a couple times. He's been punished for it once or twice, and uh, and they haven't been able to generate the rapport consistently uh, for it. They have developed chemistry further along in the season that things are starting to look a lot better than they were early on. And it's been a work in progress, but that's still a guy that he really likes to throw the ball to, especially in the red zone, uh, because Beckham is still a threat. He's still good on the football field. You know, people look at his age and, and his absence over, you know, the year plus, but he's been able to make enough happen that commands attention from defenses. And if you're not, gonna, you know, you're not going to be foolish enough to go, well, we won't, we don't need to cover Odell Beckham Jr. As, uh, you know, that's just not a reality we're seeing. Yeah, he's not the Odell Beckham Jr. we saw with the Giants, who was one of the greatest receivers we've ever seen, but he's still a good player. And, you know, I think Lamar is smart enough to capitalize on that. Well, same question I asked about the defense then. If there is an area of concern on this offense, whether it's offensive line or whatever it is, what is the vulnerable spot on the offense? The tackle situation for the Ravens is not good right now. Ronnie Stanley has been deal has dealt with injuries ever since he signed his long term extension. He broke the ankle, and then they had two surgeries on it. Missed an extra season afterwards to get a season ending surgery the year after. He's dealing with nagging injuries right now. He was in a no contact jersey uh, yesterday. And uh, that's something that we, we it's rare to see an actual no contact jersey on the field when they're practicing and uh, going up against. Nick Bosa, Chase Young with your tackles not in prime form. I mean, I believe uh, Stanley allowed seven pressures last week to Josh Allen of the Jaguars. And just overall, the both tackles. I mean, the Ravens have been rotating in their tackles at left and right side. So wow. the backup Patrick McCary has been spelling uh, Ronnie Stanley throughout different drives of the game. And on the right side, Morgan Moses, who's been solidly consistent all season still about every two to three series will be rotated in with Daniel Fa'alele so it's a it's an interesting structure that we've seen out of the Ravens pass protection unit and uh, one that it's gonna get it, it could be to their benefit that neither Bosa or Young gets a consistent guy that they're blocking and they know the tactically you know technically sound ways of defeating one guy or it could be hey, you just put in your backup against Nick Bosa. This isn't going to go well. This wasn't a good idea. And you're finding it out when it's already too late. That's so funny that you say that because last year, the 49ers were rotating their right guard. It was Spencer Burford. It was Daniel Brunsko. And I was like, who does this? No team rotates in offensive linemen like this. Apparently, I was wrong because you're telling me the Ravens are doing it. But I think you would agree, right? Like if you have to rotate your offensive linemen, things are not going great on your offensive line. Yeah, no doubt about it. I mean, you you want Ronnie Stanley to be back to his Pro Bowl or even all pro form. Right. And even if you don't have that, you don't want in an 80% of what he once was is still good. But we're not seeing that consistently enough to where they're putting in Patrick McCarry as the backup. And, and McCarry at times struggles, and, and he had one of the lowest pass protect grades last week as well. So it's it's worrisome and there's a reason that jack jackson was pressured on 50 percent of his dropbacks last week according Ooh. to pff 50 percent uh and he just had to make magic happen against the jaguars and that's what you have to hope for on christmas night against the 49ers 
last thing I want to ask you, because I, I hear this and I've kind of fallen victim of it. And I want to ask you if it's accurate. Justin Tucker this year, has he been the Justin Tucker of old or are there some some questions there? So, yes and no. Tucker is uh, is asked more than any other kicker in NFL history. He has more kicks from 60 plus <laughs> than the next nine kickers by all time field goal accuracy combined. Wow. It's bizarre. So when when you have a guy that good, you ask a lot more of him than you would anybody else. And it feels like Justin Tucker's range has finally like the 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 upper threshold has finally been reached and kicking from 59 kicking from 61 those aren't easy kicks it's it, you don't ask that of anybody so when you start to miss those and you have one from 55 blocked you start to go is this is this really what we need to be asking this guy and tucker believes he can do that because if he doesn't he's not going to be a good kicker to do so but the the upper limit has been reached i feel like on tucker he's good yes he finally missed one within 40 yards which i think that's what astounded everybody is that any kick within 50 yards is a is striking you know i do the uh, nfl kicking crown measurement every single year it's one of my favorite articles put together of the top 10 list of most accurate kickers and 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 explain there's more to field goal percentage than just that uh, you know based on on range and stuff like you would look in back basketball you're like who's the most accurate shooter in all, all time history and your mind goes Steph Curry it's actually DeAndre Jordan because he shoots from two feet away instead <laughs> of 30 feet away yeah so it's the same thing that Tucker is kicking from further distances than anybody else by multiple yards he is average miss distance is the only one prior to the season that is from longer than 50 yards he's overall just he's insane and so when he finally has any sort of stumble you go oh he's washed when in reality it's like oh he's just not a superhuman kicker uh right now and it's not even a question of anymore it's it's right now he's not we'll see next season or we'll see next game if he if it comes back because this guy if anybody has deserved the benefit of the doubt 100 percent, and it reminds me of mariana rivera with the yankees would blow one save in like april every year and people would be like oh this could be the year and then he would have an era under one the rest of the year <laughs> destroy everybody all right well there goes my hope that justin tucker's maybe falling off a little bit Kyle, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to join us. If you want to follow, uh, follow Kyle on Twitter, he is at Kyle P. Barber. Again, managing editor of Baltimore Beatdown. It's been a little while, so I appreciate the education. Not a problem, Stats. I'm happy to hang out with you.